I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Across the Airwaves. A sub-series of World War II in real time. And one in which we read some of your best, most interesting, or most controversial comments so they can get to a larger audience. Sometimes we even say what we think of them. Under our video, Hitler declares war on the USA and the Jews, viewer... Patrick 128 in Roman numerals writes, Fun fact, December 11th, Poland also declared war on Japan. But what makes it interesting is that Japan rejected it. Yep, Hideki Tojo's response was, We do not accept Poland's challenge. The Poles, fighting for their freedom, only declared war on us under pressure from the United Kingdom. Also, despite this declaration, Polish and Japanese intelligences continued cooperation against the USSR and Germany. Spoilers. He writes that, not me. This is all what he writes. The symbolic peace treaty was signed in 1957, with total casualties of this war being zero. Though I think that there were some Poles serving in the British Army or either Singapore or Hong Kong. I'm sure I read about it somewhere, but I'm unable to find anything about them. Also, Vitold, Vitold Urbanovich was flying with the Flying Tigers, but none serving directly in any Polish army. Fun fact about the fun fact above, it was the only Polish declaration of the war in the 20th century. Um, well, Poles served, they, they did serve. I mean, we've seen plenty of Poles serving in North Africa, for example, and a lot of Poles fighting um, with, the, with the British Air Force and stuff. So the Poles, they were, they were fighting. They were definitely fighting. And if you haven't seen it, then you haven't looked it up because you could just Google Polish soldiers in World War II and definitely find out a whole bunch more. Under our video, Yugoslav resistance and Serb collaboration in 1941. Viewer Dragonrücker or Dragoonrücker, yeah, in any case, writes, I'll never forget the story of how my grandpa joined the Partisans. Since he was a Croat and had just finished high school when Yugoslavia fell in 1941, he was forced to serve his conscription time in the Croatian army guard, Demobrans. Since he spoke German and French, he was given a higher rank and a command of a small 20-man regiment in Sarajevo. In 1942, the Germans told him to find the whereabouts of one famous Serb partisan from the area. By now I forgot his name, but he wasn't very prominent later on in the war. He was accompanied by one German who didn't speak our language and acted also as a translator. There he mistranslated some things, giving the German commander wrong information. He said that it was the wrong house, and also telling the mother of said partisan, since he was not home and had already joined the others in the hills, to go into safety. Soon after, he himself went into the hills, and despite being captured by the partisans at first, since he was of the home guard, he was soon accepted into their ranks after he explained himself. Years later, after the war, the partisans sent him a thank you letter, he was living in Belgrade at the time, and invited him for a cup of coffee if he ever finds himself in Belgrade. He thanked him, but unfortunately did not meet up with him since he lived on the opposite side of Yugoslavia after the war and didn't visit Belgrade that often. Nevertheless, it was a nice gesture and a story we often retell. I think that describes pretty well how incredibly complex the individual situation of the people drawn into this conflict was. Friends became enemies, enemies became friends, and the innocent were vilified and the vile were hailed as heroes. All because of the insane idea of that we are more different than we are alike. Thanks for sharing that story. Under the video, Hitler declares war on the USA and the Jews, Akosti writes... On that British declaration of war on Finland, Stalin had been pressuring the UK to declare war on Finland, the last co-belligerent of Germany Britain was not at war with. Britain finally relented and declared war on December 6. That would be uh, 1941. The Finnish Independence Day. Churchill sent Finnish Marshal Mannerheim a telegram a few days before apologizing for the declaration. A transcription of the telegram follows. Prime Minister Churchill to Field Marshal Mannerheim. It's in capital letters. Personal, secret, and private. Okay. 
Uh, I am deeply grieved at what I see coming, namely that we shall be forced in a few days out of loyalty to our ally Russia to declare war upon Finland. If we do this, we shall make war also as opportunity serves. Surely your troops have advanced far enough for security during the war and could now halt and give leave. It is not necessary to make any public declaration, but simply leave off fighting and cease military operations, for which the severe winter affords every reason, and make a de facto exit from the war. I wish I could convince your excellency that we are going to beat the Nazis. I feel far more confident than in 1917 or 1918. It would be most painful to the many friends of your country in England if Finland found herself in the dock with guilty and defeated Nazis. My recollection of our pleasant talks and correspondence about the last war lead me to send this purely personal and private message for your consideration before it is too late. Excerpts from Mannerheim's reply, uh, apparently he can't find the full text. I thank you for your courtesy in sending me this private message. I am sure you will realize that it is impossible for me to cease my present military operations before my troops have reached positions which in my opinion would give us the security required. It was very kind of you to send me a personal message in these trying days, and I have fully appreciated it. Well, that's interesting. You know, when we saw, when we covered the, uh, the Winter War, when the Soviet Union invaded Finland, and while they did achieve their aims, it was at a great cost in men and certainly at a great cost in prestige because the Finnish army, the Finnish army and the Finnish not army, they out clearly, clearly, decisively outfought the Soviets. The Soviets just had the endless manpower. Um, but Mannerheim said, and we, we quoted it in one of the episodes, it was in March, uh, March 1940. So this is before Churchill's prime minister. Neville Chamberlain still prime minister. Um, this was in March 1940. And Mannerheim said at the end of that, that, you know, we've done this, but we have paid any debt we owed to the Western, the final, any debt we owed to the Western allies in blood. And I don't blame him for that because he was treated absolutely abysmally by both Britain and France. And of course, they were invaded by the Soviets. The only country of the major countries in Europe that treated the Finns decently then was Nazi Germany because they just sort of were hands off. But if you go back and watch some of those episodes, the way Britain and France just, yeah, it, it wasn't as bad as the Soviets who were invading them to try and take land. And that's, of course, why Finland is a co belligerent with, with Germany to take back the lands that the Soviet Union took one year before, right? Under our video, How to Kill 15,000 People in One Day, the Magic Rabbit writes, Sparty, I totally hate the war on humanity videos. They make me sick. Please keep making them. I think they're the most important videos on this channel. I know so many people who doubt the Holocaust in part because people minimize the details. Those who wish to deny these horrible murders use the incomplete education on how the Holocaust was carried out to make people doubt it could have happened. I've heard arguments about how it couldn't have happened because murdering 12 million people in camps is impossible. I think that what your videos do so well is to show how the Holocaust was not limited to camps. It was carried out day by day across fields and cities, forests and ravines. Please, please continue making these records of how, when and where these massacres were carried out. The denialism thrives in the doubts caused by an incomplete explanation of the process. These videos are the most accessible and meticulous renditions of the record I've ever seen. Well, first of all, thank you for these motivating words. Highly needed. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. Now, denialism is a tricky thing. There's no really effective way to argue against it, because those who believe it are not believers out of rational conclusion. They have been radicalized into a religious belief and a mythology based on conspiracy myths and identity politics. So the only way to really combat it effectively is to try to expose reality in such an irrefutable way early enough and to as many people as possible that they simply won't fall down that rabbit hole because then they know that it's a rabbit hole. 
I sure hope that our effort here can become a significant contribution to that effort. Uh, under our video, How Mighty is the Red Army, viewer Oleg Kazantsev writes, Two of my great-grandfathers fought in the Red Army. Makar Kazantsev on my dad's side was a Siberian Cheldon, descendant of the first insular wave of Russian-speaking settlers in the Urals and Siberia. Miraculously, he did not fall victim to the dekulakization despite having a personal farm somewhere in the vicinity of Iskitim, possibly due to living rather remotely like many Cheldons did. He was over 40 when the war started, but in 1942 he volunteered and joined as a heavy machine gun operator, probably a less physically demanding duty plus prior experience. He fought all the way to 1944 when during Operation Bagration he had a shrapnel wound that the field surgeons considered inoperable. He was told the shrapnel was too close to his heart so he had about two years to live. He was sent home since the war was already leading towards the Allied victory. He lived for another 20 years, shrapnel or not. My dad had few memories of Makar except him being a fiercely independent, grim man who had a saber hanging on his Izba's wall. On my mom's side, Lev Skrybovsky was a Jewish boy from the Rovno Shtetl who was resettled under Stalin to the Jewish Autonomous Oblast in the Far East Transamer region. Now that is actually, trans that's, that region is it's not somewhere in the Far East. That's all the way on the East Coast of the Soviet Union. That's the coast of the Pacific Ocean. You can't get more transferred than that, right? Um, this later turned out to be a blessing in disguise as a big chunk of their family that stayed in Rovno later fell victim to the Nazi atrocities. He was 15 when the war started and barely spoke any Russian. In 1942, he volunteered to the front lines, lied about his age, said he was 18, and said he forgot his passport at home. The conscription officers probably saw through his lies, but enrolled him anyway. However, instead of sending him to the meat grinder, he was at first assigned to the field kitchen duty, where he learned to speak decent Russian. He later became an operator of an anti-material rifle. After getting wounded in 1944, his regiment moved too far west for him to catch up, so he was reassigned to a newly formed CQC unit of, as an automatic, a submachine gunner. He made it to Konigsberg, which is where he met the end of the war in 1945. Fun fact. You got to put your finger up when you do fun fact, okay? Fun fact. Apparently, he told my grandma when she was young that had he met Stalin, he would have shot him. Not sure if he would have had the guts or motivation to do so back in the 40s, but that speaks a lot about how complicated the people's loyalties were back then. Well, that's just a good story. I don't really have much commentary on that. Um, I, it's, but then, except, except about the relocation. I mean, you can't be relocated further than that and still be in the country from Rovno to the Pacific Ocean. It's like, oh, we'll put the Jews over there, but you're not going to kill them? Oh, come on. We're just going to send them as far as we could possibly send them away and still have them, you know, paying taxes and things. Under our video, Switzerland, neutral or Nazi ally, viewer Jason House writes, It's a good thing the Swiss had remained neutral. Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman accidentally discovered LSD in early 1944 while emulating Alexander Fleming's work investigating what pharmaceutical compounds could be derived from different forms of common molds. Although 20 years later it would have a very different historical impact, the prospect of what the Nazis might have done with something like weaponized LSD is an absolutely terrifying thought. One artillery shell filled with it detonating in a bomber stream would have rendered multiple bomber crews completely incapable of flying their aircraft or defending themselves. If the Normandy beaches had been crop dusted or shelled with it during the troop landings on D-Day, the invasions would have failed because troop cohesiveness would have instantly vanished. Uh, that's an interesting thought. And famously, the US experimented on their own soldiers with LSD in the 50s and 60s with some pretty terrible effects as well, even permanent psychological damage to some individuals. On the more comical side of these experiments was probably Operation Moneybag in Great Britain in 1964, which was recorded on film, by the way. A platoon of Royal Marines were given acid to see how they would perform during an exercise. Rather predictably, they were quickly pretty useless. Most of them were simply disoriented, forgot their mission details, and instead of taking cover or maneuvering, they just milled about, giggling and bunching around. 
many of them forgot how to use their weapons properly, or as anyone that has taken acid knows, they didn't really forget, but were so distracted by the minutiae of it all that they simply couldn't focus long enough to lo load, lock, and fire. One of the Marines did suffer a bad trip, though, and seen in the footage, fearfully mumbling, I am not going to die. No, I'm not going to die. Yes, I die, mate. You've died. No, I have not died. You haven't died. No, right, right. I'm not dying. One guy climbed a tree just, well, because. Another had to be shown repeatedly how to get to a group of trees to hand off prisoners. They were the only trees, a few hundred meters straight ahead of him on the otherwise empty field he was standing in. The trials in both countries soon faced problems, the chief among them producing enough LSD under economically viable circumstances, and how to disseminate it in the right dosage without contaminating the own troops. But the Brits concluded, despite these other problems, LSD is regarded in the light of present knowledge as one of the drugs which merits more detailed examination and testing. Well... Not so long after that, both the U.S. and Great Britain concluded that it wasn't practical after all. So, although it might be a mind-blowing thought experiment, the likelihood that the Nazis could do anything meaningful with it is pretty slim. But maybe they would have just dropped acid themselves and chilled instead of all the horrible stuff they did. There's always hope. I mean, when we're speaking of Nazis on drugs, we did do two videos of some time back about that. One about how Hitler used a lot of drugs because of his doctor administrating all kinds of stuff to him. And the second one, Nazis on speed, uh, was about how the Wehrmacht used methamphetamine in order to enhance the performance of their soldiers. And that did indeed have terrible effect, both for the soldiers themselves and for their victims, of course. Uh, you can have a look at those videos. The links are in the description. They're pretty awesome and interesting. It's scary stuff. Well, kids, that's all for today. But if you'd like to see an Across the Airwaves episode that not only has Vika in it, but is also a play, you can click right here. And what else can they do? You can join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv and you'll have a chance an even bigger chance to have your comments featured in this series. That's true. All right. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. I Ring said, that bell. I really said that lame. I'm like, oh, don't forget to subscribe. Hey, dude, man, if you got time, you might want to subscribe. Cool. See you later. Never forget. Ooh.